potential for digital communication technologies to do good, for example, in humanitarian contexts and at the intersection of peace building, security, and development. But it was going to be increasingly in, important at that time to also help folks working in that space to recognize some of the unintended harms that can accompany those technologies. Um, at that moment in time, there was a lot of energy and positivity around um, bringing innovation processes into the humanitarian space and using these as ways of um, unlocking new potential for addressing um, a range of needs, both for those trying to deliver aid and assistance, but also for affected communities and, and people experiencing different kinds of crises. Um, but as I mentioned, there were some unintended harms that were also accompanying some of those processes and those technologies, um, and it became yeah, really important to kind of focus on that. And as we did, more and more um, digital misinformation began playing um, a more overt and crucial role in conflict dynamics and also in complicating some of the issues surrounding uh, response. And we found ourselves being called on more and more regularly to really focus on the problems of digital misinformation and disinformation. Um, and so it might be useful just for a quick moment to talk about what I mean by, by those terms. And um, my fellow speakers may want to readjust or, or, or comment on that as well. That's cool. Um, but when we talk about misinformation, um, often we mean information that's inconsistent or incorrect or taken out of context such that it's incorrectly understood. Uh, misinformation doesn't necessarily come from a place of intending to do harm, but it can nevertheless end up or result in harm to people. And there are lots of different kinds of digital misinformation, a misunderstanding or a misinterpretation of information that's nevertheless shared on digital media can be one example of that. Rumors are another kind of misinformation. Um, again, that don't necessarily mean to be harmful, but they can be. But when we talk about disinformation, we're really talking about the intentional use of digital misinformation to manipulate, confuse people, uh, or, or to cause harm. And this is the type of misinformation that I think we're seeing, we're seeing a lot being featured sort of in the news today and that folks are hearing a lot about. It's even got mentioned in the breakout rooms a little bit. Um, but some of the tools and tactics that you might be familiar with are things like fake identities on Facebook or on um, Twitter, the use of botnets, the practices of micro-targeting and deep fakes. These are, might all be terms that, that ring bells for some of you. Um, that's just part of the list of, of disinformation tactics um, that are available, and that list is evolving every day. Um, and what's important to know about there is that misinformation and disinformation work together in mutually reinforcing ways, and also uh, that they work in the same way. So both of these types of misinformation exploit tensions and fears that already exist in communities or between people, um, and they amplify them. But they do that at such a speed and at such a scale that we haven't really seen before. And part of the reason that they can do this is not only because of the massive reach of social media, for example, but also because such information doesn't stay just in the digital sphere. It's part of the larger dynamic and it also spreads out into what we call the analog or real world. Um, and the effect of this dynamic is to create an extreme degree of confusion. And I think a lot of us are experiencing some of that um, confusion in our own lives and maybe even in our professional lives um, as well but it makes it hard for us to know what sources of information we can trust. And that makes it hard for us to figure out which courses of action are going to bring positive outcomes, whether for ourselves as individuals and also for, for the greater good. And the more difficult that it becomes for people to kind of figure out and discern the fact from fiction, um, the more easily it is to sow doubt, right? In science, in government, in social institutions, and in particular in one another. And that's the crux of the matter that really brings me to this presentation and discussion um, today. This widespread erosion of trust affects not only the choices that we make as private citizens, but also the ones that are advanced by governments and also our multilateral organizations. And it's a deeply serious threat to social cohesion and therefore, not to be too bleak about it, but society as we recognize it. And that's the thing, the first thing that keeps me up at night with regards to this topic. Um, 
that quickly brings me to the second thing that keeps me up at night. <laughs> and that's that um, the approaches that my colleagues and I have been observing uh, through the course of our work and through our individual lives, um, we find that many of them are really pretty inadequate um, approaches or responses in the face of the situation that we're in at the moment and the way that this is evolving rapidly uh, over time. And there are lots of reasons for this, but I think that there are three that I wanted to share with you today that um, just to reflect on here that I think are really inhibiting our ability to progress in some kind of meaningful way in the face of, of these challenges. So the first thing is, I think it's, um, there's kind of an exclusive focus on addressing digital misinformation as a problem that can be caused by digital solutions. So in other words, the more we focus on digital misinformation as a technological problem, the more we seem to overlook some of the other harms and consequences um, and sources that these issues um, kind of come from. Um, it may not be possible to generate a digital solution to digital misinformation that handles the entirety of the problem because it's only addressing half of the equation. Um, and for sure, the digital environment is really not the only site where the most egregious harms are being experienced. Um, so that's one area that I think is really um, preventing us from addressing better solutions or ways of working um, together towards, yeah, addressing some of the potential harms and, and actual harms that we're experiencing today. The second approach that I think that's problematic is that we seem to be taking a, a, high, a siloed approach to addressing um, this information and some of its consequences. So it, it makes sense, and maybe that's something that we can sort of relate to here also today um, on, our, on our call or in this event. Um, as stakeholders working in different um, um, areas or domains, I think a lot of us find ourselves affected by misinformation on our particular thematic concerns and issues, whether that's like the climate emergency or whether it has to do with public health or governance or voting or peace building. Um, and each of us are really sort of pressed upon to kind of figure out how this is playing out within our own area of concern or, or responsibility. But as we focus on our individual areas, it means that we're not talking together. So while we're looking at how misinformation is affecting perhaps climate discourse, we're not really in a position often where we can talk about how across all of these different domains, the same fundamental foundations are, um, are being eroded and causing challenges to us in advancing towards, especially those of us working it um, on social good. And then finally, um, the third approach that I think is somewhat problematic is um, in the civic sphere in specific, I think there tends to be um, a focus on present problems that we're experiencing at the moment, which also is understandable as with sort of crises everywhere. I think um, it, it's worth noting that military actors and intelligence agencies and corporate actors, um, especially those that are concerned with critical infrastructure and scholars have been sort of thinking into the future um, for some time um, around digital misinformation and with that concern, it, it consisting in a key component for many of the future work that they do. Um, the same is true, I think, in the business sector and, and the WEF is another example that um, really has in view, um, has been plotting kind of pathways towards certain kinds of um, futures with regards to misinformation. But in the public sphere, the sphere, we're not really having that conversation so much. And that raises a flag for me or some concerns because this lack of civic involvement means we're not really kind of participating in charting those pathways or shaping those futures. Um, and that is actually the third thing that keeps me up at night, because I have some concerns around whether or not these are the futures that we want to be working towards. Maybe our common interests aren't the things that are functioning as like the, the North Star to kind of guide uh, that journey. Um, and that really leaves me with some concerns. So that's sort of a blending of the personal journey that sort of brought me to this conversation, some of the phenomena that I've been observing in my work and the concerns that that raises um, that really does keep me up at night. Um, and I'm pleased to sort of be here, especially with my other uh, esteemed speakers to uh, talk about how we might be able to better understand um, and, and think about some of the consequences for social cohesion and what that means going forward. Anyway, I'll stop there, but thanks, uh, thanks. I was perfectly on time, Lisa, 10 minutes. Um, let me see, Helena, are you happy to go next? Yeah, I'd be happy to go next. 
All right, so let me hand over to you to share your journey and what keeps you up at night. Okay, that's great. So hi, everybody. My name is um, Elena, and I'm the uh, director of Build Up, which is a nonprofit that works on peace building in the digital era. Um, and so I thought what I might do is just tell you a little bit about why I think this lens of peace building, which is what I work on, is particularly relevant to the question around social cohesion. Um, how it is that we at Build Up came to work at this intersection of peace building and uh, digital communication technologies, and then mostly why we're interested in this conversation and what keeps me up at night. Uh, but I think, you know, kind of charting that journey might help us to also um, get into some of the issues of social cohesion. I have to say, it's really interesting to go after Lisa because uh, we have a very similar journey um, and some of the same things keep us up at night, but I think we just use slightly different language. So I feel like there's gonna be a lot of resonance in what I say now um, to, to what Lisa just said. Um, so I think, you know, people define peace building very differently. Um, uh, I like to think of it as um, uh, non-violent means to reconcile differences um, and to transform societal structures. Um, and so it's both a means and, and an objective, right? And, and in that social cohesion is, is a critical component of what we think about when we do peace building work, um, because it's what allows um, for uh, difference um, within common ground, right? So it's the idea of, um, we're not talking of, of peace as, a, as the end of conflict, um, but of building a, um, a society that allows for difference uh, that is nonviolent. Um, I sometimes when I think about my journey into peace building, um, I think about a, something from Spain where um, uh, during the dictatorship in, um, in Spain, Franco celebrated 25 years of peace. Um, uh, and that was, uh, that was his slogan. So his 25 years of power was 25 years of peace. And the counter slogan was always, we don't want the peace of the graveyards. In other words, we don't want a peace um, that doesn't allow for difference. Um, and so I always try to think of, of social cohesion in that way. And the reason I think that's important to this conversation is that um, it, thinking about the vulnerabilities to social cohesion is at the heart of uh, what peace builders do, right? So we try to look at what are the things that might make social cohesion more vulnerable in a society. Um, and it's typically um, the exclusion of certain groups, the dehumanization um, of certain groups, um, and the entrenchment of positions that allows for this exclusion and dehumanization. In other words, you see where I'm going, um, a lot of the things that are happening on, on because of misinformation. Um, so that's that's just a little bit about the peace building lens. Um, now, you know, my journey into into the intersection of the digital communications and peace building is quite similar to to Lisa. There was a lot of excitement about it, right? I mean, I think in a nutshell, it was kind of like, uh, you know, I'm thinking about ten years ago when I started working in in this area. Um, we were thinking, you know, digital communications technologies are being used to exploit these vulnerabilities to social cohesion. They're being used to uh, to promote violence. So let's let's flip it. Let's use them for peace. These are tools we can we can make them peace building tools. Um, there was that was the kind of excitement around it. And as we started doing that and doing some really you know really interesting work, um, what we were realizing is that a lot of the digital communications tools that we were uh, making more accessible to to peace builders were allowing a lot more people to exercise their voice. That was the key, right? The key was increasing uh, the number of people and and uh, and the diversity of people. Who had access to voice, to participation, and to inclusion, um, and that this really was um, a very powerful way to shift power towards peace. Um, and I think that excitement, you know, for me was that carried me through for, for a long time. And then at some point, a little bit like the the journey that that Lisa described, um, we started to think, you know, actually thinking of technology as a tool in the context of a conflict context is limiting. Um, that, that doesn't give us the, 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 the complexity of, of, uh, of what is happening here with, with what we're seeing happening in conflict contexts with, with digital technologies, um, because we started to realize that um, a lot of the, of the technology tools that we were working with were also shaping the human experience. They were, they were shaping the way that people were experiencing uh, their societies and therefore experiencing conflict. Um, and so we started to think that we really needed to, to, to consider digital technologies as part of the conflict context, um, like a socio-technological context, that we needed to shift the way that we, we saw conflicts to, to encompass that. Um, and for me, that has two aspects. Um, initially, um, you know, we were very focused on thinking about um, the individual aspects, right, which, which Lisa touched on a little bit. Um, a lot of the digital communication technologies that we use 
are altering the incentives that we have for engaging with others um, when we're in the online realm. Um, so we're incentivized to do certain things and not others. Um, they're, they're changing the nature of the discourse, the kind of statements that we put out. Um, and as a result of these two things, the incentives and the type of discourse that goes out, they're actually changing how we express our identities. These are all pretty critical elements uh, to, to, to any kind of, of conflict analysis, right? Um, and I guess I started very much from that perspective of like the individual, you know, the individual vulnerabilities that are introduced by digital technology. But recently, I've been thinking a lot more about the systemic vulnerabilities, particularly about the kind of content that is produced. So this is now getting to misinformation, um, how it spreads um, and how it spreads uh, through the use of, of, uh, of profiling and of targeting. Um, and, and I think most critically, the kind of networks that are created and that are almost outside of the control of the people who intended to spread misinformation. I think that's the vulnerability that I'm that I'm most worried about, um, and I think that's what's keeping me up at night. What's keeping me up at night is that I think that uh, the structure of digital communications is essentially um, making the vulnerabilities to to social cohesion be, be more exposed, um, and and is eroding social cohesion as a result. Um, so that's the first thing that keeps me up at night. The second thing that keeps me up at night is that I'm not sure I understand or we understand um, the full extent of, of this erosion or of the transformation that this is uh, creating in our societies. Again, I'm, I feel like I'm repeating a lot of, of what Lisa's saying in that respect. Um, I don't think we completely understand um, how digital communication technologies are changing um, this socio-technological context um, that we're in. Um, and I wanted to, because Mille, Mille said I, I could, uh, I'm gonna show you a drawing that I made which, I mean, it's super draft in the sense that I literally just made it to get my head around something. Um, so please don't like, seriously, this is a, a complete draft. It was handwritten when I last showed it to Mille and now I've just put it on the slide. Um, but it, it, for me, this, this pyramid um, just uh, speaks to the different levels at which um, digital communication technologies is, are, are transforming this, the, the socio-technological context, right? And, um, the top of it are the thing that the things that we tend to to mostly focus on. So hate speech, um, the use of digital technologies to recruit into into violence, um, overt targeting of individuals, whether it's through doxing or through you know any kind of cyber bullying. Um, and there's those are also the the elements um, that um, on which a lot of, of of interventions are focused. So content moderation interventions platform rules and the terms of services of platform are, are, are meant to address these, these vulnerabilities, right? The, the sort of the next level is like um, misinformation, which is mostly what we're talking about here. So this is more covert targeting, right? So this is like, you, you know, you're being targeted, but you may not know that you're being targeted with certain uh, types of information. Um, it's the use of, of, um, of uh, automated messaging to create a sense that, that there's, that, uh, uh, a certain opinion is consensus when in fact it isn't. So that's what I mean by manufactured uh, consensus. And it's the use of communications to polarize identity. And here, you know, there are a lot of initiatives that are working around digital literacy. Um, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of pressure on platforms to take on ethical rules and, and different controls. So there's some work that is happening at this level as well, right? Um, and then if we go one level deeper, um, and I've made a distinction here between mis and disinformation. Disinformation is where people are spreading misinformation, but they're not aware that that's what they're doing, um, right? Um, and, and, and I think that's quite different. So there's no intent, um, but, it's, but it's happening anyway. And, um, and here we also have things like algorithmic profiling. So the fact that certain content is being spread is, is spreading more uh, because of the way that algorithms are, are structured. Um, effective polarization, the construction of identities, that kind of thing, which is pervasive and harder to see and also harder to tackle. Um, and I think at the bottom of all that, um, in a way, and I, I have to thank Lisa for helping me think through this because at the bottom of that, I had written um, the human condition or our brains. Um, and Lisa said, well, why don't you think about that as human communication and human neurology? So I think ultimately we're seeing that because of all these different elements of how digital technologies are affecting the socio-technical context, um, there's a quite a fundamental change to human communication and to human neurology. Um, and I'm not sure that we fully understand how that's affecting us individually or the systems that, that we work in. And I'd say that's the second thing that keeps me up at night. Thanks. 
Wow, thank you, Helena. Um, let's hear from Matt as well, um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll bring it together. So Matt, I don't see you, but I know you're there. So I'm going to hand over to you. And mm -hmm. um, just a reminder to others to put, put your Zoom screen on speaker view so you can see the, the speaker in full screen. And there you are. Now I see you because mm -hmm. I'm on speaker view. So Matt, um, please share a little bit about your journey uh, to this conversation and what keeps you up at night. Yeah, sure. So, hey, um, I'm Matt, and uh, I'm a technology fellow at the Ford Foundation, but I'm here in my individual capacity as uh, a hacker and expert on surveillance. And, you know, what brings me to this on um, this disinformation, misinformation journey is a quest for the truth, really, you know, that elusive truth. You know, when I was um, younger, my parents are immigrants from the Caribbean, and, uh, you know, we repatriated uh, you know, from England to the US. And in uh, my dad's country of Grenada, they had a, a war, a battle with the United States. It's kind of a, not much of a battle, uh, you know, Caribbean Island, best known for rum and beaches versus the United States military. So it's a three day military intervention. Um, and as a child, uh, as a younger person, looking at TV, watching people mispronounce the names of villages and towns, and hearing from family and friends on the phone, total different things from our trusted newscasters, um, I began to question everything. Like, what is real? Like, is my newspaper even trustworthy? And that led, uh, you know, I'm a computer hacker. So it led to me, you know, trying to work with NGOs, civil society orgs in a quest for truth, keeping them safe. Are they the truth finders? Eventually a career in media where I worked at Time and HuffPo and CNN and the New York Times, like, are these the truth makers, right? Is this in this uh, factory where we make this ugly sausage that becomes the news? Is this where the truth is? And uh, now I work uh, in service to civil society and nonprofits again, you know, uh, in a different way, like trying to figure out like what is right. And I think like a shared vision of many people on this call is one that's steeped and centered in peace and understanding, you know, like Helena says, it's not the piece of the graveyard, it's the piece that allows for difference, but means that we don't escalate to our most primal, throw a rock at you, Neanderthal mind, right? Um, and yeah, that's, that's what brings me to this. That's why I'm so happy to speak to folks. And now, um, what, and I'm, by the way, I'm very bad with time. So try to help me, okay. help me stay on time, okay? Um, I, I even tried to start a little timer thing, but you're, you're my last hope. You're Obi-Wan Kenobi for me. So on the question of what keeps me up at night, well, I had this like crazy nightmare that kept me up at night. <clears throat> so I was like preparing my papers, what's gonna keep me up at night, no problem yesterday, hit with this crazy nightmare. And then I wake up and it's so early, it's time for me in East Coast time in the US to start this call. So let me tell you about this, this crazy dream, uh, if you don't mind total sidetrack here. So it was this idea that from outer space, a meteor fell. I heard that um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's one of my favorite astronomers and space minds was saying that there's an asteroid that's supposed to head towards earth in early November, but it was here in my dream. It had landed and it affected all human beings. And uh, you know, because we're all human, we are affected by the space dust and we weren't sure how you got it, but it was very dangerous. And it affected some people more than other. If you're, you're a high risk, you were just completely hit by the alien dust and just turned into jelly, right? And um, that's horrible. And we weren't sure how you can track it, it just spreads. And uh, I always feared like, wait, at the end of the dream, I was like, am I the super spreader, right? right? So what's this have to do with this conversation? Well, like COVID-19 and like Matt's crazy alien dust dream, misinformation, disinformation is spread by human beings. And we could stop it all tomorrow if no one spoke to anyone, right? But that is not a good way to move forward. And like this same thing, right? Like any pandemic, we ourselves, even the people on this call are quite capable of being spreaders of misinformation, disinformation, right? And, um, but like anything else, you know, there's ways you can test and test yourself for this. And there's ways that you can try to mitigate the damages and harms of it, right? And so let, let me kind of like jump into that. So like we talk about like, I'm a technologist, I love technology. And just as how diseases can go from, you know, viral transmission and human, you know, uh, bodily fluid transmission to airborne transmission, 
misinformation, disinformation, which we see as a digital trend nowadays, makes a hop to offline. And that's when it becomes the most dangerous because we cannot track it. And a lot of the attempts at using digital tools to curtail it do not work. And when we speak to the high risk communities, many of them are marginalized communities where they're not getting the news from technology 100%. You're getting the news from friends and family, trusted sources, elders, you know, spoken uh, voices and oral traditions. And once it jumps to them, it can take out an entire community and a false truth becomes the only truth. That's something that really fascinates me because in the Caribbean, we have a similar thing, right? Where, you know, um, if you're, uh, someone in your family network is verifying this information, it's very true to you, right? And so maybe that means like, you know, someone says, I swear I saw a ghost in the, in the cemetery yard yesterday. You're like, okay, there was a ghost there, right? Um, but I think technology like WhatsApp, let's say, right? They used to allow you to spread any kind of message to any kind of group as fast as you wanted to. And Facebook got caught with their hands in the disinformation, misinformation game. Um, and reduce that down so you 20 people okay now you only can spread this thing to 20 that reduced transmission it just slows down the problem if i told you hey you're only going to spread this disease to five people today you can cough on five people instead of 500 that's actually not helpful right it does not it, it, that's not the way that who would uh, the who would would uh, want us to move forward and so as people who are focused on peace and you know, understanding that a, a path to peace is by finding a shared truth, that common ground, right? Um, that Lisa and Helena both kind of talked about, that we cannot find a common ground if there is no truth, right? That path, that bridge is, is dissolved. We look at Twitter experimenting with things like, well, we can tell through our surveillance tools that you never read this link and now you're gonna try to forward it. So we'll just slap your hand and say, I don't think you read this. Are you sure you wanna send it? And you'll say, yes, I'm sure I wanna send it. And the reason is, the people who are the super spreaders of a lot of this stuff, misinformation and disinformation, some of it might be content that they're creating. And other times it is just someone who, the psychology of a person who just wants to protect their community or their friends or share something that's outlandish or maybe help someone you know, who needs help or is missing is actually someone who's spreading this, right? And I think it's our best, um, our best values and our, our shared humanity becomes uh, used against us and we, in positive mo motivation, become the doers of very large harms, right? And that harm might be something that makes you hate your neighbor for no reason. The harm might be something that uh, allows for genocide, right? For you to partake in it or for it to happen on your watch, in your space, in your country, right? So uh, how, do we, how do we best test, right? Like, you know, testing is a good way to stop viral transmission of a pandemic. How do we best test for uh, misinformation, disinformation? And I think the best way to test it is to understand the motivations behind it, how it actually spreads, like if you're having a, that approach, right? And, and understanding that there are um, tools and tactics for misinformation and disinformation, so you can see them, right? One of the things that they say that helps you, uh, when you is to have a diverse human genetic code, right? A community of diverse people, diversity brings strength, and when we're trying to fight viral transmission, right? Um, if we all have the same um, uh, issues with our immunities and stuff, right? We all can get wiped out at once. And diversity of thought itself will help protect us from disinformation, misinformation, because we're not of one mind and our neighbors, our friends, the people we see valuable as verifiers of truth, they don't agree with everything we say. And so when I drop that there, the misinformation, disinformation dissolves like, like soap, water and bacteria because it just doesn't have that protective shell of like and same mind. So diversity and dropping it in a diverse space helps us test against, is this misinformation and disinformation? Another thing that helps us is by being able to be critical of ourselves, laugh at yourself, laugh at your clothing, laugh at that mistake you made, question the most deeply held thought. And did I come up with this thought from something my grandmama told me or is this a thought that i've developed over time through research and critique right and interrogate all decisions that self-channeling is an important weapon against spreading disinformation misinformation and um let's see so i like one of the um organizations that i really ooh, that's my matt alarm telling you i have three minutes to wrap okay so one of the organizations that i really like um is uh called first draft news right and i think they're um 
first draft is what they're known as and firstdraftnews.org. And, you know, one thing that they have is um, they talk about the difference between um, disinformation and misinformation for journalists, right? Who are often seen as the purveyors of truth, but how easy it is for you to miswrite a headline and become an uh, unwilling participant in spreading misinformation, right? So um, I don't have a share slide to show, but I can quickly show this picture, right? Um, which comes from an article they wrote on the difference between misinformation, and disinformation whoop, in the link, which I think that'll work, right? And um, also I used to work with a group, uh, an NGO that's focused on the digital side of things called um, Tactical Tech. And they're a Berlin based uh, technical organization. And I was their director of safety and security at some point. And um, they have a really fascinating approach to uh, interrogating what we see online and protecting ourselves from it. But they've also written quite a lot on um, how uh, there's an industry uh, as well, whether it's advertising or whether it's through political persuasion, which adds money to the pool of motivation for disinformation and misinformation, right? And so I would say like, definitely look towards some of their resources and blog posts. They have an, um, uh, a thing called personal persuasion, which is a free PDF, but it's too long for me to want to share because people start reading it and that won't be good. Um, but uh, I would say that's uh, my call. And that's what brings me to this. That's what keeps me up at night as a hacker and a, as a technologist. And I appreciate you all for, for being here. Thank you, Mila. Wow, thank you all three of you so much. Um, I, uh, I just, I really appreciate the, um